Welcome to Melt University's 2020 Summer Program. This year, our virtual intern program will help you build your brand, inform you on a variety of career paths, and introduce you to top executives in sports and marketing. Here's your host, President and CEO of Melt, one of the largest independent sports and event marketing agencies in the country, Vince Thompson. Welcome back, students. Virtual Summer, Mel University 2020. We roll along uh, with our great podcast, our great Lunch and Learns. Uh, we've got another very special guest today. Uh, I've been looking uh, forward uh, to reconnecting with what I say is my brother from another mother. We've been through a lot together. Um, uh, Jamel Hester is uh, the Director of Franchise Leadership at the Coca Cola Company. And we're going to talk about some fascinating. Uh, elements of the Coca-Cola company and its bottler or distribution system, which he is right in the middle of because you can have a great product, but you got to get it to the to the shelf and to the marketplace for it to be consumed. And so it's a fascinating story. Um, he focuses on the commercial strategy and the segmentation. So what do we mean by that? If you're ordering a Coca-Cola in a grocery store or a convenience store, convenience retail, uh, on your campus and those types of things, anywhere, you know, uh, uh, you know, an arm's reach of desire, arm's reach of availability, uh, chances are um, he's touched this. Um, actually started his career with what we call the enemy now, the Pepsi Co. company, uh, and then went to work with the Tom James company. And I will tell you also, um, talking about making a great first impression, he's going to talk about that. Uh, one of the sharpest dress, businessman, executives uh, that I know was at Pepperidge Farm, which is one of my favorite uh, companies with the, with the goldfish and everything. So he's, he's tremendous 15 year experience. Also, uh, what I love is when I'm, what I'm studying uh, our guest on the podcast is I love learning great things about him. Not only is he a great family man, but uh, he was one heck of an athlete in the mural, in the intramural space, University of uh, Tennessee, which clearly um, he had a, a passion for sports, um, as I did, but I, I wasn't as good as he was. Played in 14 sports, coached, led the uh, the intramural programs at the University of Tennessee, which is amazing involvement on campus. And, then, uh, you know, as we say, the campus is the ultimate professional laboratory. We haven't talked about opportunities within intramural sports and those activities as well. There's a lot, a lot of skill sets there. Um, he's also uh, dedicated to causes and community, which, as you know, is very near and dear to my heart. Uh, to whom much has been given, much is expected. Very involved with the Ryan Cameron Foundation, Junior Achievement, Atlanta Public Schools. Um, you know, he and I've been to the in the trenches together. It was a brand manager with the most vaunted brand in the world, the, the Coca Cola brand proper. Uh, we met when he was first on uh, on, uh, on Coke Zero. But uh, uh, Jamel Hester, welcome to Melt University, and and I'm been so delighted to have you on today. Wow. Thank you, my brother. I always appreciate this time. Uh, I look forward to it every year and I wish you did it more frequently. Uh, so, hey, thanks for that intro much more uh, than I've ever uh, thought of myself. So thank you. Well, well, I mean, obviously you, you and I are, are very dear friends and, and, and <clears throat> been in the trench together many times. But explain to our listeners, our students, that the Coca-Cola company is a fascinating business in that they don't own or control much of the distribution of the product. The, the mothership, as we call them, manufactures the secret formula, the ingredients, the secret sauce, uh, the syrup, as we call it. They provide it to this gigantic, the most sophisticated and complex distribution system in the world, what we call in, in industry parlance, the Coca-Cola bottlers. But explain a little bit the sort of the history of the distribution and then how you serve as that bridge between Coca-Cola, the mothership, and all of these bottlers. Because at the end of the day, if this marriage is not successful every hour of every day, that product and innovations and products don't get to the marketplace, correct? Uh, that's right. Uh, you nailed it. And I would tell you, we're fortunate to partner with some wonderful bottlers. And I'll explain it in elementary terms and then how... I, I'm a small spoke in the, in the greater wheel uh, of the Coca-Cola system, as we call an enterprise. Um, you know, so the Coca-Cola system uh, is now, uh, you know, 
uh, it scales across basically all 220 countries. There's nowhere basically on the planet Earth that you can't find uh, the Coke brand or our portfolio of drinks. But the way that actually comes to life is through uh, the uh, great system uh, that our bottlers have developed. I have the fortunate responsibility to call on your friends and mine, uh, the Coca-Cola Bottling Company United. They own basically everything that you would consume, buy, or uh, drink in the six states of the Southeast. Mm -hmm. um, and the way that works, the Coke company builds great creative. You know, we are the owner of the brand and the keeper of the brands that you all all buy and purchase and wear and love. Uh, but when it comes to the actual bringing it to life in the marketplace, uh, we essentially, we sell syrup, right? Mm -hmm. uh, we, we ship drums of concentrate to our bottling facilities and they take that and turn that into fountain drinks that you may get it, um, you know, call it Chick-fil-A. And they turn that also into uh, mini can six packs and 10 pack mini cans that you get at Publix or, uh, or Kroger or Walmart. And they turn that into uh, various, uh, you know, packages that you consume and take home. And uh, there's an army, uh, Coca-Cola United alone has about 10,000 employees uh, from the CEO. Amazing, which is amazing. Amazing. From our dear friend and brother, Mrs. John Sherman, the CEO and the chairman, Claude Nielsen and the family, all the way down to those merchandisers that, uh, and drivers that deliver those products. So mm -hmm. it's a very big system, very complex, and I would call it our competitive advantage, in my opinion. Well, and, and, and so to our listeners, so you'll understand where these great career opportunities are with the Coca-Cola company. Obviously, there's a lot of great brand marketing jobs, but it is a the, the, the motherships I call it is a massive business to get that product, the barrels of the syrup and the marketing of that to our makers, our distributors. And, and so and then another career path is that if you go Google, for instance, the Coca-Cola United Bottling Company, they have been making and distributing Coca-Cola products based in Birmingham since 1902. And there are other tremendous jobs within the bottling uh, organization. Well, this is why I was so excited to, you know, to have you on today because you just see Coca-Cola <clears throat> from the outside and Big Red and, and, and all those sponsorships and all this type of stuff. And it's really, truly one of the most fascinating companies in the world. Uh, many, many people, it's the gold badge of, uh, of being a, an executive of working for the most iconic brand in the world when you consider the company's been around for more than 130 years. And as he says, uh, in over 200 companies, which is just absolutely mind boggling. But so take it a step further from your, you within your career at the Coca-Cola company, you started out as a associate brand manager on Coke Zero, did really well there. Um, uh, elevated to brand manager of the most vaunted brand, brand within the company, uh, the Coca-Cola brand. So, but, but i we've talked to, uh, several people who've, you know, uh, Tia Cummings, Seth Freeman, who've been brand managers as well. And one thing they talk about is the term brand manager is sort of a misnomer, uh, term because you think of brand as a marketing position, but you're basically running a profit and loss and you're running a multi-million dollar, multi-billion dollar business as a brand manager. So talk about the, the, talk about that role and that function and the tools that you needed to acquire as you rose through that, uh, through that, and, and through those ranks. And then even when I started my business and somebody say brand manager, I made an assumption it was a vertical marketing job, but I mean, it's your general manager of a giant business. Yeah, you really are. And uh, if you approach it that way, you really can get uh, the full uh, breadth of the experience, right? So as we call them ABMs, associate brand manager or BMs, brand managers, no matter what CPG you work for, none greater than the Coca-Cola company, in my opinion, but no matter what CPG you work for, uh, it is a general management experience. So in a day, right, let me just give you, you know, what the day looks like in a day. Uh, you'll you'll probably be at the head of the table of 50 to 150 people. Um, and you are the leader of that ship uh, to try to understand what are the biggest, most important programs, uh, partnerships, uh, product innovations, uh, you know, whether it be, you know, uh, at your table, you'll have people that are scientists that protect the, uh, the taste and quality of your product. 
you have people at the table that work in the MELT organization that help us activate our brands at Commerce mm-hmm. Game Day, or activate our brands and advise us on the right strategy for, uh, you know, when we show up on College Game Day or show up at NCAA. Right. You have people at the table that are supply chain enthusiasts and help us ensure that we're transporting and shipping in the right containers in the right uh, time frame. You have folks that are of finance, all gamuts of the overall business, anyone that you can connect with at your university that you sit and you go to. Uh, those folks uh, matriculate up the ranks to sit at that table where you are the captain of that brand and where it's going. And that's what it is to be a marketer. I, I, and, and, and by the way, and so, I mean, it is a tremendous responsibility coming out of college, coming out of a, a master's program, because uh, you truly are directing a massive, complex choir of very, very bright people who, you know, uh, and, the, and I'm always fascinated with the innovation pipeline at the Coca-Cola company as well, particularly now, you know, our, our listeners are the most sophisticated consumers there are, there are more competitive choices. 30 years ago, it was Coke and Pepsi. And now I think I read where there's every year, there's at least 800 uh, SKUs of non-alcoholic beverages making it to the, to the, to the shelves every year. And so, so you've got a company this giant, um, it's, it's massive. So you've got to, you're always managing and working with various constituencies, but now you also have to be nimble and have speed now, which is, is that sort of fascinating within a giant multi-billion dollar organization, wouldn't you say? It's amazing. I would tell you that Zorin, uh, our, our uh, recently installed uh, chief operating officer, coined it very well. Uh, he said that the Coca-Cola brand is behaving, though it's 130 plus years old, but it's behaving like a teenager. Right? Wow. Because, and I, I would agree with that, because we've seen the, the fastest growth in the Coke trademark in the last 18 months. Uh, than the, the brand has seen likely in the last four or five decades, just given mm-hmm. innovation, Coke orange vanilla, Coke cherry vanilla, mm-hmm. and the consumer's embrace of those wonderful products. So, uh, it, it, and many other things, right? From a package variation perspective and many cans and some of our transaction packages, but you have to be nimble in this state. And the only way to do that is to listen to your consumers, uh, to move into research, to get out into stores and, and be a consumer. Because uh, you all that are on this phone, you all own the brand. We don't. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Uh, and that's how you have to think. And that governs the decisions you make at that table. Yeah, I mean, because you, 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 when, you're, when you're navigating a, a $40 billion organization, I mean, it's, it's, it's you know, large as countries and, 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 and GDPs and all that. And, and, and uh, we could talk about <clears throat> this for days because I'm, I, you know, I, I, uh, my dad had a grocery store. I grew up stocking Coca-Cola coolers and I've just been fascinated. Uh, and I'm always fascinated. It never gets old to go into the Coca-Cola building and hopefully one day we'll be able to have all our kids and host them down there like we always do. And you guys have always been great guests, but I'm, ne- I'm, I'm, I'm still continually fascinated with the organization and what my message would be to our students today is that whether it's the Coca-Cola company or any major corporation that you're targeting for a job or an internship, this is the type of information and knowledge and research that 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 you need to be pursuing uh, to fully inform you in your job or intern search. And and back in the old days, I always tell them they laugh at me because I had to go to the library and get an encyclopedia or yellow pages or a resource guide. And now they possess all the information at their fingertips, which we'll talk about in just a little bit. But let's go back to your college days, uh, University of Tennessee. Um, obviously, you know, you had a passion for sports and athletics, but you also not only translated that passion into playing, but, and we say, you know, one of our big sayings is the campus is the ultimate professional laboratory. They're never not going to be, they're never going to be surrounded with as many opportunities at their fingertips to grow, learn, listen, take initiatives, self-starting, self-discipline as well. So, Talk about how you translated a passion into almost, I mean, you could have been a coach, you could have run giant intramural programs or even athletic departments. So you had that passion and and we keep talking to our kids is that pursue that passion with zeal, but I'm impressed, you know, because I was involved with intramural athletics on both sides, playing and and doing sort of some of the things you did, but talk about uh, that passion and how that role shaped and formed your growth path. 
Yeah, it, it shows up today because because of my I started playing uh, first ball baseball at four, and then I basically played everything else all the way up. But intramurals was great. So first of all, I needed a job. Let's be clear. Okay, so I needed some money, and I found out that work study uh, takes the form of many different things, and I was able to get I don't know, I think it was eleven hundred dollars a month or something of that nature to go do some of my homework while I was working at the intramural rec, but also. Uh, participate as either an official or lifeguard or many different things that I actually mm -hmm. enjoyed. Uh, so that was one. And he understood the administration of intramurals. I mean, it was a huge business uh, that I didn't know about. Massive, right? So how many, uh, so on a typical UT, Georgia, Auburn campus, I mean, there's thousands of kids yeah, playing thousands. like tons of sports, right? Thousands. And I would officiate from call it 2 p.m. to almost 11 p.m. Games, 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 games. Just, I mean, it just was immersed wow. in the, yeah, I just loved it. So I became very good uh, in that space. Uh, and then also we, we kicked some butt as well when I played. So I mm -hmm. uh, did enjoy that. So yeah. uh, it was a great experience. Awesome. Mm -hmm. And you spent four years doing that, right? So, so, so students, we've talked a lot about athletic departments, but we haven't taught, which I'm, I'm, I'm glad we're talking about today. We haven't talked about the opportunities within our, in our mural because uh, officiating, which uh, we could loosely define, uh, you know, Jamel, one thing we're talking about is building brand new. So oh, yeah. you wouldn't just say on the resume, I'm officiating um, 100 intramural games a year. I'm actually managing conflict among dozens of competitive athletes, right? Oh, yeah. So it's, oh, yeah. it's kind of how you package that brand, yeah. how you build that brand you, uh, how that appearance, how that impression builds brand new. But within intramurals, there's administration, there's registration. There's event management, there's venue management, there's putting on the games, there's 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 clock keepers and all that. So um, we haven't uh, this. Is, I'm so glad we're talking about this today because it is a very undermined opportunity uh, on the campus. So put and we're going to put it in our lunch, lunch and learn next week, put the intramural department within that. And so coming out of Tennessee, what drove your decision to pursue a career path as a quote unquote brand manager, corporate executive working for these. I mean, you've worked for some incredible companies. And so what, what sort of drove that path? Cause we're always talking about path with our kids. Yeah, for sure. Uh, my uncle always tells me we're the product, some, some product of our decisions. And I just try to, I've always been a long-term thinker uh, in college. You don't really know. I didn't see this, but I did see something in a tie, I carried a briefcase. I saw something, right? I didn't know what it was. Mm -hmm. So what I started to do was uh, really just, I didn't have the internet as much as you all do now. So what I started to do is just look at successful people. I tried to understand what was success. You can define it any kind of way. And in my day, it was Forbes magazine. It was Fortune. It was magazines. That's basically right, 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 that's right. all I had. And uh, oh, I would start to say, okay, Bill Gates was the guy at that time, Warren Buffett. There was many others. You know, you look mm -hmm. at the Forbes 500 or 100. And I would not just worry about what they made. I would look and read, how did they get, what was their first thing they did? What was the second thing they did? Read the biographies of people you want to become. And basically that's my roadmap. So I used that uh, and a lot of them uh, were in the CPG, you know, fast moving consumer products uh, companies. And, and then I started to say, okay, well, what, what, what things do I like? I love Nike. Right. I wear a bunch of Nikes. I love Jordan. Right. I love Coca-Cola products. So uh, that's a logical place because those will never go away. Right. I started thinking about things that have utility, brands and, and, and products that have utility that I cared about. Uh, so from there, I just started doing research and started applying. And But I started with who do I want to be? And I didn't see it around me quite yet. Uh, I wasn't quite fast enough, tall enough to be the best athlete to get paid. I could play, but I couldn't get paid. Uh -huh. So I said, who is getting paid? And then how did they get there? And then what companies are they at? And they definitely were at Coca-Cola, Pepsi and other companies. So that's mm -hmm. that's how I started. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, that's uh, so the, your first job was at Pepperidge Farms, correct? Uh, first one out of college was Pepsi, actually. First was Pepsi. OK, yeah. so mm -hmm. so how did how did you get in the door there? What was the path there? Yep. Because working, applying for jobs at these giant companies is yes. so competitive. Yes, and it's going to be even com more competitive now. But what did you do to differentiate yourself and to stand out in the 
because we're I'm telling all these kids every interaction now is an audition, whether what you're posting on on social media, on LinkedIn. Uh, I, I, you know, what my pet peeve is, is I get these generic solicitations for jobs attached to my resume and I need to make X, Y, Z. I immediately flush them because they don't yep. do any homework on me or melt or what we do or anything. So they're sending, these people are sending the signal of what type of team member and employee they're going to be. So what are your tricks in the trade that you use? Because like I said, it, it is not an accident. You work some of the greatest brands in the world. So share your tips, share your secrets. Yeah, you got to rise to the top and you have to learn how to articulate your story, right? If you cannot articulate your story and why your story is so unique and different than everything else in the crowd, it's going to be very different, difficult for anyone to listen beyond five seconds. I call it the first five seconds you meet someone. Uh, mm -hmm. But it's also going to be very difficult for someone to say, OK, he or she's the person for this job. So let me give you a couple of tips. Um, how I got to Pepsi, again, uh, university is where you build your brand new, right? Intramurals mm -hmm. taught me people. I managed 30, probably 35 different officials, right? It wow. taught me how to deal with conflict. It taught me how to deal with uh, injuries. Like how do I, who do I need to have on staff that's ready in, in case something happens? Mm -hmm. it, it's damage control. I still do that today, right? So oh, yeah. all those scenarios, also helped me in my interview process. Because again, you're in college, I wasn't a master's degree, so I didn't have a bunch of huge work experience, but I did make sure that I articulated what I did do and brought value to it and, and tried to correlate it to what they were asking me to go do at Pepsi, right? So that's one, use your experiences and figure out a way to strip away one or two or three things you learned and why you would bring value based on that experience. So that's storytelling. Right. That's number one. Figure out how to articulate who you are and what you bring to the table. Second, uh, the second thing I would say, let's move from the Pepsi job to others and move it up the chain. Right. So getting the first job, telling my story and being ready for the opportunity. Uh, I think the second thing is, again, looking for unique experiences and difficult experiences. Right. To help, again, mm -hmm differentiate you. Also, while I was in college, I don't put it on my resume. I don't say much about it. I sold books door to door for Southwestern. So wow. if you've ever heard of Southwestern, you know uh, what I'm talking about, but I'll give you 10 seconds. I knocked on 5,700 doors in St. Joseph, Missouri and sold 500 people. Do the math, right? That's a, that's a, that's a pretty <laughs> strong closure rate. It is. But, it's but by the way, oh. think about this. Five thousand seven hundred doors and, and 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 i know our students who are very tech savvy and very sophisticated but if you guys have never sold a book or something door to door you want to talk about the toughest job audition on the planet Period. is getting doors slammed in your face and it's just unheard of now but 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 talk about that experience because you know, Jamal, everybody says, well, you know, Vince, what do you do for a living? And I say, well, I'm in the rejection business. I get told no 99 times, a, 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 you know, out of 100 a day. And the other important lesson I wish I had learned at their age was not to take that rejection personally. And the N-O is just the first two letters of the words, not yet, not no. That's right. That's right. And a lot of not yet on that. But talk about, talk about, talk about that experience. Like, like, like. That's pretty, you know, I, I, again, I didn't know this, uh, which I, you know, I, I think you should put it on your resume because it's just as impressive, you know, as hell. But talk about that experience. Talk about what it taught you. Yeah. So what that taught me was who I was, because we took 150 people from the University of Tennessee. All, all colleges do this every summer. In the first week, Vince, 95 went home in the first week. <laughs> wow. OK, so I hadn't sold a book yet, but I wasn't going home. Right. Week two, I'm literally I have no transactions, no revenue, no profit. There is nothing been sold. And I probably knocked on 600 doors at this point. Wow. So you, you got to think I have been literally captain of every team I play. I have not lost in anything I've tried to do. And this is the first time I'm really tasting absolute agony and defeat and I'm, I'm not sure where to go and this is what i call the wall 
you hit a wall and you say, either I'm going to go through this thing, I'm going to climb over it, or I'm going to find the end of it to go around. Mm-hmm. And it's raining. I'm on the corner of Hayes and Jackson in South Joseph, Missouri. And I had two hours left. And I said, okay, before daylight, right? I said, okay, if I get one person to buy in the next two hours, I'm going to finish the summer. If not, it's not for me. Mm-hmm. And that's the moment where I became who I am today. Sold uh, Miss Jones on Jackson. So three other people that evening before 6, 6 p.m. And I closed just about a uh, 30% rate for the rest of the summer. Wow. Didn't make a whole lot of money, but right. I'll tell you, a lot of character. And that story translated and, and, and brought me to the top of the package, the blue chip choice from Pepsi because of that story. You see what I mean? Ah, it gives me chills. That's unbelievable. Yeah. yeah. So and, and so 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 the we tell our kids life's not linear. They're going to get knocked off the saddle a lot. It's not it's not if and, but it's when. But how you get back on that saddle, correct? That's right. So so I, I that, that's just an amazing, impressive story. And so talk about uh, we talk a lot about to our students the value of mentors, and I know that. You've had great mentors. You're a great mentor. Um, we exchange stories on mentoring and, and leadership, but I'm encouraging our students, if they don't have them, to seek out and find mentors. Talk about your experience with mentors and who those are and were. Yeah, they're huge. And, uh, you know, Vince is one of mine, right? So just they're huge well, because you. they become brothers. Uh, they become sisters. They become Mm-hmm. Um, I don't, I have never kept and maintained the one the company gives me. I just haven't done a good mm-hmm. job there. Uh, it's organic, but I tell you, I look for folks that, uh, that first that have walked in shoes and places where I've tried to go, uh, where I'm trying to go, right. Because they have wisdom. I respect wisdom. Uh, the second thing is I look for some type of commonality, you know, so hopefully we have something else we can talk about that we love beyond, uh, what you can help me. Uh, accomplished, right? Mm-hmm. But, uh, but but let me tell you. Uh, so there, there's no real formula for getting a mentor uh, that I can give you. Uh, I just would tell you that I put a specific amount of interest in learning more about people. And what I try to do, I don't know if I'm getting a mentor, but I'll reach out to a Stuart Kronagi when she was at Coke and just say, mm-hmm. "Hey, I love what you're doing. I'd love to know a little bit more about how you got to where you are." Never mm-hmm. stop being curious. And that became a sponsor later, right? Mm-hmm. I mean, I mean, as soon as I sat down with her, she said, I'm going to sponsor you. I'm going to mentor you. I'm going to, but I wasn't looking for that. I was just trying to learn. So right. Always be curious and be open to ask, can we have a Coke break? Can we just go have a conversation? I'm dealing with something. Love to get your perspective. I saw you said something on stage that was pretty impressive. Just love to hear more about that. That's how I've created mentors. And I have a pretty, wide diverse range internal external spiritual mm-hmm. physical whatever you want to say uh, to help me uh kind of coach me up sometime so. well and, and 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 that's spot on and this is a, a great segue into talking about the value of building and maintaining relationships and and and, and one of my sayings is the first two letters of the word relationship uh, are re those are also the first two letters of the word reciprocal, which means you got to give and you got to take. Yep. Uh, but talk about the value because it, you, you and I, you know, we hit it off the second we met one another. We didn't even know why. We just had this great chemistry with one another. And and we may go three or four or six months without, you know, uh, without talking to one another. But if you call me or I call you, we get right back to each other and say, hey, brother, what do you need? And so talk about the value that because – my old man, uh, he always says the world turns in a circle 24 seven, but now that's like 24 minutes and seven seconds. I mean, it flies fast. So you, you better be treat these relationships as, as, as precious gems. Would you, would you agree with that? Oh yeah. I mean, from, for me, there's, there's a reciprocal nature of mentorship, right? Because I learned this, I'm going to give you a lesson. It was a hard one, but it changed the way I think of mentorship. Um, one of my mentors is now the, EVP reporting to the CEO of Walmart. Uh, at the time, he was just the vice president of Pepsi for basically Georgia, mm-hmm. kind of like Mr. Mike Zuko, basically. Uh, so, so basically, uh, he was what you would call my mentor. And uh, I missed the ball on an assignment at Ingalls with, uh, you know, just 
what we're supposed to do. We're supposed to have a certain look of success in the store. Uh, he did a walk with the head of Ingalls, and it didn't go well, right? Mm-hmm. He lit me up like you would not believe. <laughs> Like like your uncle does, right? Mm, <laughs> right. No, no, I've had I've, I've I've had those light ups, but it wasn't because it wasn't in front of everyone. But he did it in a way because he wanted me to understand. Not only now are you representing me and what I believe in you and this company, but I mean, not only are you representing yourself and your team and this company, you now represent me because I speak for you. So when you don't do well, it reflects back on me. Mm-hmm. So there's a responsibility. When you do have a mentor that pours into you, that you have to assume, you have to think about that. So, well, and and again, you know, we we tell our kids it's like, you know, constructive criticism is absolutely invaluable, and don't take it personal, and seek to learn. Hey, what did I do wrong? What can I do can do better? And it it's we call it tough love as well, but 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 it, it's so invaluable. So. Talk about, because you're going to hear from our students. Our students are very amazing, reaching out, following up. You're going to get some handwritten notes. You're going to get some uh, shout outs on LinkedIn. Uh, I mean, they really, really love this. But but what gets your attention on an outreach? Let's say it's, a, 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 we'll use LinkedIn because that's, a, a, that's obviously a big one. But what what gets your attention if somebody is reaching out to you on LinkedIn that would prompt you to respond. Yeah, I like that because, you know, you get a lot of them. So um, there's always this thing of breakthrough, trying to figure out how to break through. And I used to call it uh, Malcolm Gladwell. I got it from Malcolm. He said stickiness, mm-hmm. right? I think it was in tipping point. He talked about being sticky. How can your communication be sticky so they either remember it to follow up or break through in a way that, that they don't forget it? What I would say is, uh, you know, I, I don't have a, it's your personality has to come through first. So be authentic. Mm-hmm. If you're a person that does the jokes, that's fine. I, I literally try to understand my audience, like truly. Uh, and I don't reach out to someone unless there's something, uh, that I, I have a connection with. Uh, now there's, there's a different space that you all will be in and trying to get, you know, from an employment perspective. So I get that, but go deeper, right? So if there's an employee, if there's a VP of HR, that you're trying to reach out to or head of HR that you're trying to reach out to, research them. Maybe there's a publication by which they stated something about the organization. Maybe there's Absolutely. something there and then say, hey, I'm in the market for an opportunity. I feel like I'm a great candidate. You know, some of the things you said about the organization and how you all look at talent interest me more than others. I would love to kind of have the opportunity to talk more mm-hmm. versus, hey, here's my resume, highly interested in this job. Could you call me back? It's going to be very different. It's well, you, you, you're not. You, by the way, you're not going to respond. Yeah, what, yeah. Because what what you, they're already showing you what type of teammate or employee they're going to be, and we talk about it's only as important as you make it. Put that effort in. So, for instance, if you were reaching out, hey, Mister Hester, I you know I, I go Vols. I went to the University of Tennessee. I'm amazed at your you know your your prowess in intramural. I played you know intramural basketball, et cetera, et cetera. Um, I'm fascinated to learn more about you. I'd love to seek some advice. You know, you know, package it up. Be your brand. Be brand you. It's how you package and sell this. Uh, because here, here's the thing: there's no excuse not to do that now because all of the information is right in their hands or at their fingertips. Correct? That's right. That's right. Well, I like that. You, you know, students. Uh, we always ask to go to of our guest, Malcolm uh, Gladwell, obviously he's, you know, prolific. I love his, uh, I love his stuff. I mean, just so unique, but, but also you've got a very impressive track record in this community with uh, tremendous organizations. Like I said, Ryan Cameron, um, big in the radio business, amazing foundation, junior achievement, amazing organization. Coca-Cola company is very committed to boys and girls club, Atlanta public schools. So what I'm telling our students right now, is that a it's always important to, to to give back but they're on a college campus surrounded by amazing opportunities to be involved in causes and communities because not only is that helping others out it's 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 padding that resume or coding that resume with self-starting an initiative and helping others out so talk about your philosophy on that and talk about the importance of it 
and why that has always been important to you because that's always impressed me about you yeah I, i'll tell you i can i, I think um and I, I pull a lot from others that inspire me i think i heard will smith he's got this seven minute uh youtube video that i probably watch every week i don't know the name of it and i'm going to send it to you Vinny, so you can share it but it's, it's a snippet of various interviews he's had and he said something in it i think three minutes in he said i want my life um to mean something i want the people that i come in contact i want them to benefit from just meeting me right and i, I fully believe uh we all have a responsibility to mm -hmm. change this world mm -hmm. it doesn't mean all of us will be presidents it doesn't mean all of us will be laborers but each one can do something so i don't think i can ever do enough uh i just need to do a better job of finding more opportunities so community for me is like in my dna i come from the community i've lived at many different you know socioeconomic levels at this point and it doesn't really matter how busy i get we owe it to humanity to give our story to inspire even if it's five thousand or 500 people i'm talking to if one person gets it uh, so I just try to find those outlets and just share my story. That's that's really all it is. And then, uh, you know, have conversations and debate about, you know, civic and, you know, civil and social injustice and all that, whatever it may be. But I find things that are passionate to me. You're not, you won't see me at any nonprofit. I try to pick those that I think I have a true passion for. And right. I work with them. Yeah. Right. And that goes back to the, the passion. But, I, you know, one thing that I've always tried to live by is that, you know, to whom much is given, much is expected. That's obviously in the Bible, and 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 that's kind of my creed and your creed is that if we can touch one life through any of these things that we're doing, activities, communities, intern programs, or all that, then then we made a difference, which is which is which is why we're actually all here. These accolades, the titles, the jobs, none of that really matters in the end. It does. You got to make a living and all that, but but it's 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 what you give back. And so, as we close this, share with our students and our listeners, some of your other go-to podcasts or books or resources that you would recommend to them that they would read and follow uh, the beverage industry, the marketing industry, the, the, the brand industry, business. Uh, Cause obviously you, you're like me, you, we've always been, you know, readers, we read a lot, we consume a lot. Um, what are your go-tos? Yeah. So uh, I'm always in my word. So that's one that gives me the most wisdom. Uh, but I would tell you that uh, there's a couple of books that have had a profound impact on me. I'm a little old school. So I'm a book person. I haven't really gotten all the way into podcasts just yet. Um, mm -hmm. I'm still getting stuff on YouTube. <laughs> so, no, I'm, I'm right there with you. So what I would say is book wise, I'm a Gladwellian. So anything Malcolm, uh, one of the biggest ones I would say is David and Goliath because of his connection to scripture. I just really, and I am, I am truly, truly David. And I feel like all of us are. So I think that is a great book and story and connection to those who do great things uh, be, despite their circumstances and their upbringing and things that are in front of them. So David and Goliath is one recommendation. I would say, go get and read that. Um, Coca-Cola. I came to Coke, not because I was born in Chattanooga, but because I read Neville Isdale's Inside Coca-Cola. I came here not to be a marketer. I came here for the system. When I found out how big and wide and how many careers you can make at a company like Coke, I just, I just fell in love. So Inside Coca-Cola is a great book. Highly recommend uh, that you check out. And I, I would say from a uh, content digital perspective, um, I, I listened to David Goggins. So David Goggins uh, has a phenomenal story. Literally just Google him and you'll find a plethora of not just, uh, you know, his, his book himself, many different interviews he's done, but transformed his life to literally become one of the most uh, strongest and fit uh, individuals mentally and physically that this, this uh, humanity has ever seen. So I thought those are three that are, are interesting. Well, Malcolm Gladwell, you know, obviously just one of the best. Uh, I love that book, David and Goliath. If you don't know students and listeners, please um, <clears throat> look up Malcolm Gladwell. A tremendous inspiration. Secondly, uh, Neville Isdell was the, one of the former chairman of the Coca-Cola company. Very highly respected, wonderful man. Um, I'm very dear friends with 
Javier Goizueta, whose father, uh, Roberto Goizueta, was also one of the fabled leaders of the Coca-Cola company for many years. So those stories um, inside Coca-Cola with Neville, look up Javier Goizueta. I mean, because not only the fascinating reads, the Coca-Cola company is fascinating, but the business and lessons of humanity, uh, because the Coca-Cola company is not just a beverage or soft drink company by far. And that's a whole nother podcast that we'll do another day. And then David Goggins, I think, is, uh, is another tremendous story. And so we always love our guest sharing their, their, their insight and their advice and their wisdom and their resources, um, you know, as well. But um, Jamel, in closing, uh, Director of Franchise Leadership for the Coca-Cola Company, uh, tremendous uh, sharing of inside baseball, insider knowledge of the Coca-Cola Company and its bottler's distribution system, obviously an amazing uh, college career at the University of Cincinnati, uh, go Vols, uh, you know, climbing the ladder uh, with Pepsi, with Tom James, with Pepperidge Farm, some of the most vaunted brands in the world. And I think you can see, listeners, why uh, he uh, is successful, has been successful, and will continue to be successful, not only in his professional life, but his personal life. So, uh, what an honor and privilege, Jamel, for you to join us today. I'm sure you're going to get a lot of positive feedback from this. And we thank you so much for sharing your time and your insight and your advice uh, and your wisdom uh, with our virtual interns from Mount University. Always a pleasure, my brother. I love you. I thank you and I appreciate all you're doing. And you all reach out anytime. I'm all over the net. So you find me, you got me. Mm-hmm. Well, I, you know, I love you too. Like I said, I mean, you know, we've all got to, we all got to grind through all this craziness is out there and hopefully get back in the offices one day, but, uh, but, but, but students, listeners, please listen to this podcast, share it with your friends, listen it over and over. There's so many valuable, uh, you know, I call them nuggets of wisdom uh, within these words. And so Melt University, summer 2020, virtual Melt University, we roll on and we'll see you and hear you soon. Thank you. Thanks, Vince. Hope you enjoyed today's virtual class. We'll be back soon with another edition of Melt University 2020.